Hello and welcome to Data U and this presentation on automating data modeling tasks. Today I'll be talking about automating tasks that you as data modelers do regularly in your work. Um, I'll quickly go through some of the benefits of automation and then dive right into an example, hopefully giving you some insight along the way. My name is Jason Hahn. I am a developer here at Embarcadero. I've been working on ER Studio Data Architect and the ER Studio Repository for about uh, 15 years now. All right, now that you know who I am, let's start with the what of automation. So, what tasks can we accomplish through automation? Well, uh, anything that you have to do multiple times is a candidate for handling through automation. Also, tasks that have multiple steps are good candidates uh, because the more complex the actions uh, you're taking, um, the more potential gain there is to avoiding doing them manually. Um, there are a ton of things that can benefit from all kinds of different kinds of automation. I list some examples here. Um, obviously, when you build cars, you're doing the same steps over and over again. Um, when you're naming constraints in your data model, um, you're following the same basic rules over and over again. Um, and you know, even when you're doing dishes at home, you're really just following certain steps multiple times, basically the same way every time. Now, what tools can we use to automate these tasks that we've identified? Well, ones that can repeat actions the same way again and again. Um, pretty obvious, but also tools that can kind of adjust based on input. So, you know, you don't want something that is too strict um, because you want to be able to have it adjust based on small changes that you have to what you're giving it. Um, so, uh, obviously, some tools that map with the uh, examples we had earlier are assembly lines for cars, macros for uh, naming constraints in your data model might uh, be helpful, and of course dishwashers are a great way to automate doing dishes. Uh, unfortunately for me, my family doesn't have an automatic dishwasher in our home, so we're kind of out of luck there, but uh, I do have ER Studio's macro editor, so I'm going to be using the constraint naming example later on in just a few minutes. Uh, now that we've identified a few tasks maybe that uh, could be automated, we really want to know why we should be going through the effort of setting up the automation uh, when we can just do the tasks manually. Okay, well, like most of what we've been talking about, the first answer is pretty obvious. You want efficiency, right? An in initial investment in an automated process can um, really uh, pay off if you use the um, automated task over and over again. Um, every time you need to accomplish that goal, you go and reuse your automated process and you save time. The more you do it, the more time you save, the more effort you save. But I think that um, even more than just plain old efficiency gains, uh, there's another benefit, uh, and that's consistency. So, um, automated processes don't forget things. You know, once you've written it, uh, you can expect consistent results every time. Uh, macro doesn't forget a step just because it uh, forgot to have its cup of coffee in the morning. Um, versus if you're doing something manually, maybe you just forget one tiny little thing you don't notice, um, and then it crops up later and causes you a bigger headache. Um, so it's not just faster to do the work, but it saves time later in uh, solving problems, avoiding problems, and stuff like that. So uh, another part of consistency is that your output kind of follows the same pattern every time. You feel uh, you can feel confident that you you know what you're going to get when you look at the results of a macro. Um, a lot more so than if you're just doing everything manually. Uh, this helps if you want to make changes later on, even if you didn't make a mistake, um, but if you used some sort of automated task, and later on if you want to make a change, you know that, hey, I'll, I know what I have to find and 
replace um, in order to update this. I don't have to worry about outliers or things that don't fit the pattern. So all this consistency um, is great because it leads to greater efficiency, of course. So now that we know why you might want to automate a task, when would you not want to automate a task? Well, um, again, the question is all about efficiency. Some tasks are temporary. You're only going to do them a few times and never going to have to do them again. Um, is it really worth the, the effort to automate it when you're just going to throw away that macro and not use it again? Or whatever the, the tool is you're using. Um, also, if uh, a task is complex. Now, generally, complex tasks are good candidates for automation, but if it's too complex, um, then the tool you're creating, the macro or whatever it is, uh, might be too complex as well to make it worth it. Um, you don't want a bunch of, um, you know, steps that you have to add your macro and, and checks and, and, you know, if this, then that, and, and stuff um, for hundreds of different possibilities um, that you could probably do by hand just as easily. Um, so you have to kind of be wary of those tasks that are so complex that they don't fit into something that could be reused. Um, similarly, if a, a task has too many dependencies or too much input, then again, you're you're not gaining any uh, efficiency by spending the time to automate the task when compared to how much time it might take to do it manually. Now that you've decided you want to automate a task, um, question is, how can you do it? So, let me show you. Okay, so for this example, I've got your studio data architect open. Um, I'll be using the emergency admission sample model that comes with ER Studio. And the scenario that we're going to solve is that we've been asked to no longer use system generated names for not null constraints in our Oracle databases. So we've got to go through and update or set the not null constraint name for all the columns in our Oracle physical models. So, for example, let me edit admission here. We've got four columns that have that are not null. Um, I can edit patient ID, for example, and there's no constraint name set in your studio. Most likely, no um, default or, or just using the system generated name in the database. So we'd like to go through and set these names here in ER Studio in our data model so that they can eventually be updated as necessary um, in the database. Um, what we're going to be using is a pretty straightforward naming convention. Um, I'll start with NN underscore for not null. Um, then we'll be typing in the table name underscore call name. In this case, that's patient ID, and uh, that will be our not null constraint name. So let's just show over here in the DDL. Got uh, constraint name added here. So that's what we want is our DDL to show the constraint name. Going back though, we have an extra little wrinkle we need to worry about. Um, we need to make sure these constraint names are 30 characters or less. So uh, if we go to admitting nurse and we do our regular, let me copy this name here, we do our regular nn underscore admission for the table name underscore admitting nurse ID. Now we have a constraint name that is 31 characters. Um, trust me on that. I counted. Uh, so um, our, our boss has told us that the naming convention is to start with the first character um, after the prefix, the nn underscore prefix, and remove each vowel until we get it down to 30, um, except we're not supposed to remove that first vowel. Um, you don't want to make it mission. So we'll leave that one there and get the very next vowel and delete it and keep doing that until we get down to 30. In this case, since it was only 31 characters, we just have to do one. And we hit OK and go over the DDL. And now we have 
and an admission, admitting nurse ID as our constraint name. So, as you can see, now it's getting a little bit more complicated with the checking, you know, removing of the vials, making sure they're 30 characters, and there's still two more columns in this table, let alone the other 14 tables in the model. So, we're going to go ahead and automate this task. So, let me uh, cancel out of here and discard these changes so we can do it properly in a macro. Now, um, three things three major themes I'm going to be hitting on while I'm writing this macro with you. Um, and those are readability, reuse, and robustness. Uh, good error checking, making sure that it works under many cases. So, just be prepared. I'm going to go over those over and over and over again. Okay, so um, let's start off on our macro tab and just add a new macro. Okay, we've got our Ear Studio macro editor open here. Um, the first thing that uh, I like to do, and this has to do with readability, is to add a little set of comments at the top to indicate what this macro is supposed to be and a few other pieces of information. So, okay. So now that we have a little bit of information in here, I'm going to go ahead and save it right away. Uh, just save as. Uh, this brought me to the sample macros folder, physical modeling, Oracle macros, because this is an Oracle specific, so I'll go ahead and take advantage of that, um, taking me just to the right place and, and save it here. Okay, now we're ready to get started on real code. First thing we got to do is grab the active diagram and the active model to make sure we're running on the entities or the tables in that active model. So I've got a couple variables there, one for the diagram, one for the model, and I'm going to assign them to the active diagram and active model. Now back to readability. So I use D and M as kind of shorthand for diagram and model, but that's not very readable for other people using this later. Maybe, maybe later in the macro they're going to see a D and, you know, is that a domain? Is that the diagram? Um, you know, it takes a few extra moments to type in a little bit longer name, but I think it's worth it um, in the long run, uh, especially because you don't ever really know when you're going to be confused by a shorthand. Um, just a little extra time in the beginning and now we know that we're talking about the active diagram or the active model. Um, seems kind of silly sometimes but you know these little things actually really save you a lot of time later on. So now that makes it a little bit more readable but we have to think about robustness first thing is trying to consider all possible scenarios. Maybe it's not you running this macro, maybe it's your coworker you gave it to, they're supposed to work on the Oracle models in, in their f division. So they open it up and they, they run the macro but they don't have a diagram open. Um, you know, is this going to work? No, actually it will fail. Um, so we need to add a little bit of robustness, a little error checking here and um, make sure that uh, we can handle these cases nicely so that the user the user can overcome them quickly and easily if they if they mess up on first try. Okay, I've added a couple extra lines of code. Um, basically, it's checking the active diagram after we try and get it, and if it's nothing, that means no diagram is open. So we put up a little message box saying, "Please open a diagram," um, and immediately quit. Uh, if there's no active model. Well, that doesn't happen because if you have a diagram open, there's always an active model. So we instead check to see if the active model is a logical model because obviously there's no not null constraints in the logical model. Uh, in this case, then we say this model is designed to be run on Oracle physical model. Please switch to an Oracle physical model and try again. So now we have, you know, the makings of a macro. Um, it's always good to kind of run as you go and, and, and check things as you go. So let's make sure the code we have in here is correct. Um, 
one thing I use is this immediate window, which is kind of a, a logging window. Um, debug dot print is how you print something out to it. So I will print out uh, the name of the model, maybe. Okay, and let's save this and run it and see what happens. Okay, uh, shows up here physical. That's the name of the day, physical model, of, and so we have. Uh, successfully gotten the active diagram and the active model. Again, with our error checking, our descriptive variable names. Um, if you just want to make sure your error checking is working, you can switch over here to the logical, uh, run it again, and we get an error. This macro is designed to be run from Oracle Physical Models. Please switch and try again. So that part is working as well. So now you kind of feel comfortable that uh, what you've done so far is working. You can move on to the next step. So I think now we want to go ahead and loop through all the tables and columns in the model. So first to do that in these macros, you create uh, variables, again with reasonably descriptive names. And you start uh, an empty loop to loop through all of them in the active model. So here we have for each entity in the active model and each attribute in the current entity. Um, again, we want to test, make sure that uh, what we're doing is working. So a simple way to do it is to debug.print uh, current entity dot name. See if that works. Aha, uh -huh, we have a problem. Again, this is why we check. So, uh, method or property not found. Uh, entity doesn't have a property called name. That's because it has a property called table name or entity name. What we want is table name. So, we will run this. And I was wrong. Current entity does not have something called table name. It has something called table name. And we're still in the logical model, see? Um, I highly recommend actually doing this. I mean, it seems like there's all these little mistakes, but this is this is how you create the macro. You test it, um, and you solve these issues as you go, and it makes it so much easier um, going forward for you. All right, now I think we've got it. If I run this, I do see all of the see first the model and then all the table name. So that's correct. Um, let me add a little bit better. Uh, information to my logging there and uh, maybe here there okay let's try this again and uh, all right that looks a little bit better so we understand what's going on um, and we can do the same thing for attributes so let's take this let's uh, add it inside this loop column name and see what we get. Okay, now we got a lot of logging output. Each table, each column. All right. Um, let's clean that up a little bit. Instead of doing the table, let's just add the table name to the column output. So we can do the table name and maybe dot and column name. We'll delete this part here, so now it should have kind of the table dot column notation for each column name and try it. And again, that works better. And we can feel comfortable that we are correctly going through all the entities or tables and uh, columns in the physical model. Now the next step is uh, for our task. We're looking for columns that have uh, that are not null and don't have not null constraint names. So we can get started looking for that. So we want to, if it's a not null, so I'm going to put if not current attribute dot null option, then, right, and an else in there too, and we'll just move this debug print. So make sure that we're correctly finding the null option for each attribute, and we'll run it again, make sure that's correct. Uh, and we have a type mismatch on null option. Okay, so. What's the problem here? Well, let's go to our object browser. 
see what the issue is. Um, it took us right to the attribute object, current attribute. Let's look for null option here and read the help string. This is the nullability of the attribute. Values are null or not null. So, aha, it takes a string that says either null or not null. It's not a Boolean like I guessed. So, I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm going to stop the macro and then I'm going to change this to check against not null. And see if that works better. And yes, it does. And now we have a big list of columns and whether they are null or not null. Um, let's make sure that's correct. So I have here admission with patient ID, admitting nurse as not null, and then release comments and release time are nullable. And if we just look over here in the model, that is accurate. So we know we did that part correctly, and we can move on to the next one. Now, um, I talked a little bit about uh, readability. I talked a little bit about robustness. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is reusability uh, and code reuse. So um, reuse is just another form of automation. Uh, the same ideas that uh, happen when you're trying to figure out whether you want to write a macro to do a job. You need to consider whether you it's reasonable to write a, uh, a function or a subroutine to do work that gets done repeatedly in your macro. So if we're looking at this here, we're, here, we're doing some work. We're combining the table name with a dot and the column name. Um, what if we wanted to change it instead of a dot? We want to make it a colon, right? Um, so we change it to colon and we run it and we see that, oops, we forgot to change the second one. This sounds like a candidate for code reuse. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a new function to do this work for us, right? Luckily, I have that function already written up for you. You don't have to watch me type it. So we have table and column name, just combines the table name and column name. Um, we're going to fix it up a little bit because we want to be more reusable. We want to actually be able to specify how we want to separate the two, right? Maybe you want the colon, maybe you don't. So we're going to add uh, something called delimiter as a string um, and use that here instead. So in this spot we are going to call the function instead and we want to use go ahead and use dot notation, that's fine. Um, so it sends the entity object, which then figures out the table name, and the attribute object, which figures out the column name. And we can do that same thing down here. And now we can uh, we have some code reuse. Right? Let's test it, make sure it's working, and it all looks good. Now. Um, uh, in the sake of robustness, another kind of trick that's specific to the ER Studio macro, but uh, is important to do, is to check for error. Now, it's important to always check for an error. I'll show you the trick for this kind of macro. Um, for example, let's say you had code that did current attribute dot um, uh, teradata using sample. Okay, you wanted to print that out. Um, now that's not going to work. We are an Oracle Oracle uh, uh, platform. But uh, if we run it, it still returns something false. What, is, what does that mean? Well, how do we know that that's not right? Maybe, maybe it's better to check to see if there's some sort of error. Um, and the way that we do that in ER Studio is we uh, check the function um, diagram manager dot get last error code and uh, I'll print that out okay uh, these two functions uh, have a return an error code or error string based on if you uh, if a function that you ran um, doesn't apply or has some other error when you ran it. Um, it gets reset every time you call another function. So let's say if you just call it after each one, then you should get the proper error. And 
this is what it looks like. Um, models database platform doesn't support Teradata used to sample, which makes sense. Okay, so that's a good idea to do. Now, of course, if you're going to be checking this all over the place after each function you call, then probably a good idea to put it in a function or a subroutine. Um, so I will go ahead and add a function that does that. Okay, so here's my little function that I like to use, um, subroutine, and all it does is check for error. So we can change this to simply check for error. Um, I'm going to comment out the message box part so we don't see it for every column, but if I run this, now this check for error is reporting the error of using sample every time. I'm going to add check for error in quite a few places. I mean, you don't need it everywhere, but I like to have it every time I call something like no option, um, where uh, maybe this is not you know, valid for the platform or something like that. So we've got some readable variable names. We've got error checking, robustness. We've got code reuse. We've got a couple of uh, subroutine and a function here so we can reuse the code. Um, it makes it easier to make changes going forward. Um, we're getting closer. Um, now let's just add the actual meat of this uh, macro. Uh, first thing we're going to do is check uh, for the not null constraint name, right? Uh, if, the, if the column already has a constraint name, we don't want to uh, change it. We want to leave that alone. Um, we're assuming it's done correctly. So we create a string variable, not null constraint name, and assign it to the value of the current attributes, not null constraint name. Um, always check for error. And uh, we can uh, we can actually run this right now, um, just to make sure that no errors come up. So let's check it. Um, okay, no, I don't see any errors here. That's good. Um, so now we have this constraint name. If you want, we can even output it, um, just to make sure it's showing up. Uh, okay, so for all the not null ones, uh, we have a lot of empty spaces, none of them have a not null constraint name. Alright, so the next step is to check, verify that the um, constraint name is non-empty, or the, excuse me, that it is empty. So if it's zero, then we want to do our work. So this is where we're going to be doing the setting of the constraint name. Um, luckily, we first of all we know that our our format is going to be nn underscore table and column name, right? Well, we have a table and column name function already done here, so um, <laughs> let's reuse it. Let's go in here, uh, set the constraint name. Uh, make sure we type it correctly. Equals uh, nn underscore and table and column name um, current let's copy that and but remember we want to use uh, underscores to sep you know to separate the table and the column name so let's uh, let's try that let's see if that works um, before we actually set it in the column let's again test it um, and run this and now we have some not null constraint names. Okay, so we're doing good. Now, one minor detail, and I'll just go through it quickly, is um, I don't like these uh, strings in the middle of the code. Um, it's not that big of a deal again, but you're trying to make it clean, make it easier to change. What if in the future you want to name it uh, just with a single N or something like that? Uh, you're going to have to look through the code, find it. It's probably easier to have some sort of constant value here. Um, okay, and I like to put the constants up here. Const there. So we have this value. We can also 
for use later, add a const for maximum name length, make that 30, and uh, use that. Again, let's run it, test it, and okay, we still got the nn underscore good. Um, now we got to check it for a maximum of 30 characters. So, so again, it's, uh, it's it's always wise to do simple steps first, make sure they work, and then go to the more complicated. So the first thing we're going to do is just uh, truncate it. So equals and uh, oh, I don't want to use thirty. I want to use our constant here, here, and here. And so let's run this. And did we get any? Yep, yes, we did. So here's admitting nurse ID. That was the one we used before, right? So the D got truncated to make it 30 characters. So now we know that we are finding the constraint name, making sure it's proper length, and um, fixing it if it's not. Okay, so one uh, major task to go is to fix it properly, right? We don't want to just truncate, we want to follow the rules that we set up um, earlier. Well, lucky for you, I'm not going to go ahead and write that function. I already have it written. Um, so this is our, our macro here. Now, it looks all nice and good, but, uh, you know, if you're just looking at this, you won't understand what it's doing. So, again, one key portion of writing macros and what's something that I've failed to do so far in this demonstration is to use uh, comments to explain what's going on. We really want to have other people reading this um, understand what we're doing. So we can add a few comments here. So if the name is already valid, return immediately. Okay, here. Uh, in this loop, we loop through each character, assigning it to the new name variable unless it's supposed to be skipped. Um, here we want to point out that we're skipping vowels, and here we want to point out that we don't skip the vowel if it's the very first character. Okay, and almost done. I have finally actually do the assignment of the next character. Okay, so now we have a few comments in here. It's a little more helpful when somebody's trying to read and understand the code. Um, you know, uh, now we have see some uh, comments that make this a little bit more readable, a little more understandable for someone, even yourself, coming back to it a little bit later. Um, and we're going to go ahead and use this function back up earlier where we had our constraint name and uh, instead of just truncating. And through some more magic I just rearranged the code quite a bit to get to where we're trying to go um, which is to finally combine the table names, reduce the size if necessary to 30, and make sure the prefix is correct, and uh, here we have an, a debug log. I'm going to erase these extra debug logs to clean that up a little bit so we can see. Um, and run it to see what we have. Now we're not actually setting it in the column yet, but uh, we're going to run to see what it says that we're getting. Just to test it. Um, okay, we have patient ID set correctly here. Um, and Admitting nurse ID, we're not, we're no longer truncating the D at the end. We're getting rid of the I here. That looks correct. So we're looking good. Um, now we can go ahead and set it on the attributes or the columns. Um, all right. And. Make sure we check for error. Okay, if you're ready, I'm ready. We're gonna we're gonna run it. Looks okay from here. Let's uh, check the admission DDL. 
And hey, look at that. Not null constraints. Probably with the I missing, set the patient ID correctly. I think we're good. So, after all of that work, we have a macro. Let's make sure we save it. Save often. I didn't, but you should. Uh, we have this macro here that can go through and update the constraint names for the columns in our physical model. Um, we see did a pretty good job, set them all. Um, we can run it again uh, if we want. Let's run it again. S make sure that it doesn't mess up if, you, if it already finds some uh, columns that have a name and run it. Oh, worked well. We didn't find any because we set them all last time, so that's great. So now we have a, a macro that we can run anytime on the entire model. It'll only um, add constraint names for ones that um, need them. Um, there's a million things you can do uh, with this further. You can set it to only do the selected tables. You can um, have it verify that the current constraint name matches our format that we're looking for. Um, and, you know, a million other things. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, remember the um, things we discussed already we talked about um, making sure identify which tasks makes most sense for automating you know, you know cost benefit analysis of how long it'll take you to do the work based on how complex it is um, and also how often you'll be using it reusing it um, a lot of times it makes sense when you're doing something over and over again I mean there it, it these things, uh, it seemed like a little daunting to set up in the beginning, but uh, you know, once you get the hang of it, you'll be faster, and uh, it'll, it'll be easier to find tasks that are worth the investment. Once you decide to go ahead and do it, remember uh, to make code readable, to make code reusable, um, you know, write, write those functions, those subroutines if you need them, that, uh, another mini form of automation that'll help. Uh, make your code robust. Um, add the error checking. Uh, handle edge cases. Is this is the diagram not even open? Is this a logical model? Test as you go. Keep running everything you're doing, and you'll actually have very solid, um, very helpful macros that will make your uh, work more efficient, um, make your entire group more efficient. Hopefully, make you a happier data modeler going forward. So uh, go off and, uh, and write some macros with all this information and uh, if you find one that does the dishes please let me know. Thank you very much for your time. Okay so we've gotten a number of good questions during the session. Uh, the first one came from Joel and he said can you please explain the hierarchy of the tool? At the top level you have the file and diagram and model. Is that correct so far? How many models can you have in one diagram, or how many diagrams can you have in the model? Jason, I know you answered this, but go ahead and explain and walk through your answer for. For a DM1 file, which is the file that's saved out by your studio, you're going to have one diagram, what we call a diagram per file. So you know you, those are kind of interchangeable um, in in the way we talk about uh, our our uh, models. Um, the each diagram can have uh, one logical model. Um, we kind of enforce one logical model for every file. And then you can have as many physical models as you'd like um, underneath that. You know, I've seen dozens in certain, in some files. Um, and then within each model, you can have kind of subsets, different displays. I mean, uh, the, the names kind of get confusing. We call the, uh, the graphical display of the objects, the, we also call that the diagram. Um, you know, you can have uh, uh, a separate graphical display of your objects in each, in a, in a submodel. Um, and you can have many, you know, hundreds of submodels in a model if you, if you really need to. Um, so basically the hierarchy is diagram at the top and then, you know, one to many models underneath it. And then in each model you can have uh, one to many submodels that have different graphical displays of the objects in the model. 
Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, you got a compliment here from Sebastian. He said, nice VB coding live demo. How long in months is the learning curve for all of these methods, properties, inheritance? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends on the individual, um, obviously. I don't think, I think, uh, you know, as I said in the thing, I don't even know all of the methods and the properties and the objects and the inheritance um, myself for, for this tool. Um, I do a lot of searching and, you know, checking the help um, and even even checking on checking online um, when I'm trying to figure out what the best uh, object is and what's available. Um, you know, there's there's actually quite a few, and other people have asked for for resources online. I know there are resources online of of other data modelers who use ER Studio, who are familiar with the you know automation interface, and who um, kind of promote macro use and have examples. So. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever get to the point where you learn at all, you know, but it shouldn't take too long to actually get working. You know, I don't even think it would take months. Probably just take, uh, you know, a, a week or two to just get familiar with, you know, where to look first, um, mm -hmm. and then just use your resources to find uh, answers as you need them. And then practice makes perfect. So, the right, more you exactly. play with it, the the easier it gets. Uh, Lindsay said, "What can't a macro do?" <laughs> <laughs> dishes um, so uh, yeah I mean as I mentioned if that's a serious question we there are a few things I mean uh, our area studio automation interface is pretty comprehensive um, it doesn't have 100% coverage but it's it's pretty comprehensive you know right down to uh, most of the you know specific platform um, uh, like storage options or, or name not no naming constraints uh, you know um, those are, or excuse me, not null constraint names. Those are all kind of available in there as well. So, um, you know, even if you can't find it at first glance, sometimes you have to find the right name for it. You should be able to find almost everything. Great. Um, okay. Alf asked if table name is nearly 30 characters, you may risk making the same constraint name for several fields. Could a truncation table be a table name be an idea? Maybe to fifteen characters. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, that's probably a better idea than mine. I mean, I just kind of grabbed one for the demo, but you know, you got to think about this ahead of time. And then, you know, actually, that's why um, I love doing something like a macro. Is you code it in your macro, and then you don't have to remember what the you know is this truncating the table of fifteen characters first, or is it you just go to the the truncate the whole thing, you know, once you make your macro and, and run it, then it's kind of set in stone and you don't have to worry about it, uh, you know, being forgotten. Great. Um, Sumi has asked, is there an open ER Studio macros community that ER Studio users can access? It'll help to be able to reuse a macro that's been built rather than build it from scratch. Um, I'd actually like to pitch it on this. There is an ER Studio user group community on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, people do submit questions and challenges there, and, and it's not specifically focused on macros, but certainly that could be a topic to share there. Another plug I'll make is uh, the newly updated uh, Embarcadero user community, community.embarcadero.com, and we are adding and expanding our database content to this community, and macros would be a great topic to bring up there. So uh, if you want to sign up for the Embarcadero community at community.embarcadero.com, then uh, you can kick that off for us. Yeah, I think uh, sharing macros has is, is always been a, a popular uh, user uh, forum kind of activity. I remember, you know, well, maybe a decade ago, uh, seeing on the Info Advisor site a lot of sharing of macros and stuff like that. So um, there are definitely places to look, and hopefully the Embarcadero community site um, can, can build up a good collection of uh, user um, supplied and, and provided macros. Great. Info Advisors is definitely an excellent resource. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Lindsay also asked, can I create a new model, submodel, or picture via a macro? Uh, yes, you can. Um, there's uh, a collection called models in the diagram, and you can add. There's an add funk method. So same thing with uh, Submodels. There's an add method in the model. You know, you, generally you want to look at the hierarchy and then uh, and find the parent, and then there should be an add 
a collection of the objects and an add function in that collection, but uh, absolutely, you can do all that stuff. Great. Um, I just wrote yes, so if you want to add some more in the um, actual answer box, that'd be great. <laughs> um, Alf asks, is this demo available? And uh, of course, this session will be available via replay, um, but it, do you have a CANS demo version of this, Jason, or how would a, a customer be able to uh, replicate this themselves? Um, sorry, if I have a CAM version of this, I didn't hear, hear that part. Um, a canned question. demo, if there's oh, something canned. that's uh, downloadable off our website or uh, another resource for customers to do the similar type of thing? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think you'd want to go to, um, you know, when, this, uh, when we post these uh, videos for the Data U, if you want to see the video, um, if you want to see the macro that I actually wrote, um, you know, we can probably find a way to, to get it to you, um, you know. The, the text itself, but uh, I think the video is probably best to watch on, on the data use site when that's up. And when we post all of the um, sessions and the presentations on the data use site, we could also post the source uh, document if you want to share that. Yeah, I think that's probably best. That way everybody who, anybody who wants to, to review the, the demo can, can see it and follow along to the final document. Great. All right, um, next question from Lindsay is, I know standard virtual basic, does file IO, uh, does this version? I'm not sure I'm yeah. parsing that question correctly. Yeah, yeah, um, sure, you can create dialogues. Um, some of the sample mo macros we have in our product um, have dialogues in them. Um, it's not as fancy as maybe visual basic or, um, you know, some things that uh, some other tools uh, can get, but uh, you sure it works works well. You can, you know, ask for user input. Um, it's kind of too much effort for this demonstration, but it, that's available. And I definitely recommend looking at some of the sample macros um, and how they both create uh, UI, you know, um, dialogues, and also how they interact with something like Excel. Excel. Looks like uh, we have a question from JC that says uh, this might be done best done in physical implementation rather than in model. Um, but I recommend using the database to fix and query columns and constraints instead of using macros. In Oracle, I use Dynamic SQL to generate other scripts and fix the tables and constraints issues. Uh, do modeling tools need to be more oriented to modeling and documenting data flow of processes? And we have uh, Ron Huzenga, our product manager on the line, who responded to that one. Ron, do you want to share? Uh, yes. Um, generally speaking, the major value in the model is the collaboration, uh, particularly when you're working with large data architecture and, and development teams. And in many, most of my projects over the last years, we ensured that all the rigor was applied to the model. So we were doing agile development, for example, and the model was the database in terms of all of the uh, physical characteristics were modeled for and engineered and generated out so that everybody was uh, singing from the same songbook, so to speak, because we would then deploy into the different environments and everything else, but all changes uh, would be communicated and originated back in the model and then pushed all the way through. And when you do that, you have one source of record and uh, no room for confusion. Um, the next question from Sebastian is, can the macro get the GUI context, for example, custom actions? Back to Jason. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, the answer to that is no. Um, so, you know, if you have some automated task that you want to go through the GUI, I mean, there, like I said earlier, a lot of it's automated. But maybe some of the wizards you have specific tasks you want to do. Um, that's not uh, available in our in our automation interface. Okay, thank you. Um, and the last question I see right now is from Lindsay. Um, I think it's clarification from the previous comment. It says right. file I/O read and write to and from an Excel file, for example, or Word. Uh, so I think okay. those are some of the functions she wanted. Yeah, and the, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. It's actually the same <laughs> same answer as before because the, the sample macros do a lot of reading and writing to Excel. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm not sure if any of them have or show any writing to Word, although um, I don't say, I don't, see why that would be a problem, but uh, absolutely, we do, we have uh, internally, some of our internal macros we use can write out to, you know, 
a text file and so we can write XML or, or JSON data um, to uh, a text file um, and and the Excel is is actually widely used in our sample macros it's a great resource just because um, you know it makes it visually appealing to to see the data in the Excel spreadsheet so absolutely that's possible excellent thanks so much um, one more question just popped in from Cheryl. Oh, two more. Um, from Cheryl, are there any plans to enhance the macro designer? I'm asking about simple functionality like find and replace. Yeah, um, actually I didn't uh, show it in the demo. The find and replace are available if you right click. In fact, there's quite a few things that are available when you right click including find and replace. Um, it's not as user friendly as we'd like. Uh, so, um, you know, something like hitting F3, it doesn't actually work in this macro designer. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that stuff is available. You just go and right click and, and peruse through the menu items. Um, and we are actually enhancing the macro designer or at least improve, upgrading it. Um, the next version of our release, XE6 is coming out this year, should have an updated version of the um, macro UI. Um, I don't think we have any specific enhancements planned for it other than just upgrading the new version and any fixes that uh, the third-party software has added. Um, but that's something we're looking at too is uh, you know, making something like find and replace easier, that kind of stuff um, going forward. Okay, great. Um, I think, let's see, Alf has asked, when writing macros, could I then write to other file formats other than Word and Excel? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, text documents are easy, but any application that has a COM interface, uh, you know, uh, you can access through our uh, macros. Um, and also, you know, you, you've, you don't have to actually use our, our SACS basic uh, interface. You can write C Sharp programs to access through our automation interface C++ um, you know visual basic and if you if you have visual basic stuff so uh, instead of the one that comes with our uh, application all of that uh, can um, access uh, the automation interface as well so you can both write in another program to access your studio and write macros in your studio to access other programs that have a common interface and all of this David I um, can, could uh, Delphi also be used? Yeah, you can use Delphi. Just say install and then go and find the COM automation interfaces for your studio and all of a sudden they'll all show up as components in Delphi and C++ Builder. So you can use them. Yeah, actually we have uh, quite a few um, Delphi examples by one of our support agents who uh, you know, does a lot of macro work and he likes to use Delphi to do the work here too. So that's definitely a good option. Okay, great. Um, Stuni asked, in ER Studio data lineage, we are unable to copy and edit the data flow. Is there a macro that can do this function? Uh, yeah, there's a visual data lineage export to Excel and import to Excel, um, or import from Excel. So that is uh, the best way to, to do what you're looking for. That's how we do it. Um, you know, you can export one data flow and import into another one, um, and it works pretty well. We've, that's something we've added recently and, and does some testing on. Just make Excellent. sure you're using the, the visual data lineage import and export. There's another one just called data lineage which uh, uses our older data lineage system. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, Mary has asked, can a user who does not have administrative rights to their PC use the features we have seen today, including the metadata bridges? Yeah, um, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, having admin rights to your PC is whether or not you can install software on it, perhaps. Right. So that, but you, you have to install the MetaWizard, or is that uh, just accessible through the application if uh, ER Studio is already installed? Yeah, if ER Studio is installed, it's available if you have the proper licensing for it, um, and it shouldn't require uh, administrative privileges. Uh, for especially for your studio, um, some repository things you need special privileges when you're on the server, obviously. But your uh, studio itself uh, should be able to run pretty well without uh, administrative rights. Okay, 